Hi Internet! Welcome to the Gretron YouTube channel. To celebrate the release of Final Fantasy 16, I decided to release 16 videos ranking the Final Fantasy games in a variety of categories. Each game has their strengths and weaknesses, so I thought it would be a fun way to compare and contrast the games. These lists are just my personal opinion, trying to balance objectivity and personal preference, and likely failing to satisfy anybody. So, if you disagree with my ranking, which you probably do, let me know your ranking of the subject in the comments below. For this video, I'm going to be ranking the main character from each game. It's not going to be based upon how strong they are, or how much I like the game necessarily, but rather how good of a character I think they are, based upon my personal preferences. Get ready for one of the most subjective lists on this countdown, and also, get yourself ready for spoilers, because I might need to if I want to discuss why I think a character is great, or conversely, not so great. Alright, now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's get into the ranking. Number 16, Final Fantasy 1. Coming in at the bottom of the list is Final Fantasy 1, which truthfully has no singular main character. Final Fantasy 1 has four main characters, the Warriors of Light, with no personality or dialogue. They're blank slates lacking any agency other than their destiny to save the world. The designs for the different character classes are actually pretty great, and the attempt to amalgamate them into the Warrior of Light as a representative of the game is actually pretty cool. I like the design for the Warrior of Light, and he serves as a cool mascot for Final Fantasy 1. That's all he is, a mascot. He doesn't really have anything other than being a surface-level representation of the first game, and ends up being more of a concept than a character. There's basically nothing here, so when judging main characters, the Warrior of Light is less a character and more just an archetype, and pretty easy to rank at the bottom of this list. Number 15, Final Fantasy XI. Similar to Final Fantasy I, in Final Fantasy XI your character is a blank slate, but you get more agency in customizing their appearance through gender, race, hairstyle, facial features, and wardrobe. Your character in 11 is actually able to emote, have dialogue choices, and communicate with other players in the world, so your character in 11 does have some semblance of a personality, unlike in 1. There can be a bit of a disconnect in your personality, acting one way in a cutscene, and acting completely different when playing in a party with friends. But if you're like me and just acting like a shonen anime character all the time, you might find some tonal consistency for your avatar. 11, through its systems, allows for more fun headcanon than 1. Your character has a house, friends, accomplishments, rivals, and so much more. With the plethora of expansion content, you can watch your character grow from a run-of-the-mill mercenary to a legendary hero who still maintains a down-to-earth friendly disposition. You can write the story for your character based on how you play. My character, Lito, is friendly, optimistic, and always willing to help others, though he finds that his eagerness to help often gets him into sticky situations. He started off his adventuring journey by moving to Bastok, and after some time in Sandoria, he ultimately settled on a house in Winders. Granted, he spends more time renting rooms in Juno and Adulin, and probably hangs around more on his private beach off the Adulin coast than the peaceful forest city of Winders, but it's the place he ultimately chose to call home, because his house in Winders came with a fountain, and paying the immigration fee again is annoying. Lito is also a time traveler who has defeated different lords of the underworld and saved all of living existence numerous times. He's also very polite when asking for help. That's Lito. Final Fantasy XI's main character is what you make it, more so than one, but because Final Fantasy XI's character isn't actually a defined character, I don't feel justified in ranking main character of XI any higher on this list, even if I've become quite partial to Lito over time. Number 14, Final Fantasy XIV. Final Fantasy XIV does basically everything Final Fantasy XI does in terms of characterization, but better. For starters, there's far more customization in terms of appearance. In addition, your character in 14 has far greater story significance than your character in 11, who is still a really important figure in the world of 11, but just one of many important figures. In Final Fantasy 14, however, you are the most main character -y main character to have ever main charactered. You are the single most important person in the history of 14's world, by a wide margin. You are the chosen hero of light. In 11, you're not the chosen one, just a really competent mercenary who happens to get involved in world-shattering events. In 14, you're the chosen hero of destiny. A lot of people say the big appeal of 14 is that you really feel like the warrior of light, and it's fun to play as yourself in a Final Fantasy game. So they make characters that look similar to themselves in real life, and some even use their real life names as their character names. This was the approach I took when playing 14, to see what the experience would be like. It was certainly amusing and definitely interesting to see myself act as the hero in a Final Fantasy adventure. No, not that Final Fantasy adventure. In real life, I got into a lot of fistfights as a kid, so seeing myself act as a shonen anime brawler is something that feels natural and right. That said, I actually like playing as Lito more than Gred Troyan, 
and would rank myself lower than Lito in terms of main characters, but that may be because I've seen more of Lito's personality develop over having played far more of 11 than 14. Also, in terms of humility, it feels weird ranking myself above other characters on this list. Gred Troyan, better main character than Cloud Strife. Yeah, I'd be doing a comparison like that. So instead, I'm looking at the main character 14 being another blank slate, like 1 and 11, but offering more agency, a bigger role in the plot, and better customization options. So, in the end, the main character of 14 may rank above the main characters of 1 and 11, but I can't rank it any higher due to the nature of character creation as a dynamic here. Number 13, Final Fantasy 3. Final Fantasy 3 has a different main character depending on which version of the game you play. If you're playing the pixelated version of the game, then the main character of Final Fantasy 3 is the Onion Knight, one of four identical orphaned children from the village of Ur. But if you're playing the 3D version, the main character is Lunath, still an orphan from the village of Ur, but with a distinct design and personality. His personality isn't overly complex, but he is an actual, real main character. If I was just ranking the Onion Knight, he probably would have ranked below the main characters of 11 and 14, because while the Onion Knight has a great design and some dialogue, he's still more of an archetype than a character. Lunath has an actual personality and backstory, which is more than can be said about the previous entries on this list. He's not the most fleshed out character, but he's still an actual defined character. Thus, the protagonist of Final Fantasy III may be weaker than other Final Fantasy titles, but an actual character exists here, and it allows Final Fantasy III to rise to the number 13 spot on this list. Number 12, Final Fantasy V. Bart is a pretty bland character without much personality. He's basically just a dude who likes to travel and go on adventures. He's like a less interesting, watered-down version of Goku. Bart's is kind-hearted and easygoing. Yes, he has an actual backstory, but in day-to-day -day life he just kinda chills and goes with the flow. What else can I say about Bart's? Butts is a pretty fun name, I guess. The only reason Bart's ranks above Lunath is because Lunath was retconned into later versions of Final Fantasy III, but Bart's has always been the lead of Final Fantasy V. Number 11, Final Fantasy II. Final Fantasy II was the first game in the series with defined party members and not just blank slate characters. The cast in 2 is actually a pretty solid cast overall, but most fans agree that the three teenage leads were a bit more thin in terms of fleshed out characterization. Which brings us to 2's leading man, Firion. Firion is a main character who doesn't have a ton of personality, but he does have one. He's determined to fight against the Empire and make a difference in the war. He mourns the loss of his home, and the heartache of his loss motivates him to battle against impossible odds. He deeply cares about his friends and constantly puts his life on the line to defend them. He's also a lustful teenager who can't resist a pretty girl. Yes, he's a somber, sulking teen trying to grasp at the horrors of war and the PTSD that brings, but he's still a teenager, and his hormones are raging. He tries his best to be noble and honorable, but he has significant flaws. He's not the most complex character in the series, but there's certainly more to him than any of the entries below him on the list. While I would like Virion to be fleshed out a bit more, I still think he's a solid lead character, but not quite top 10 material. Number 10, Final Fantasy VI. Lots of fans argue that Final Fantasy VI has no main character, and instead has an ensemble cast full of characters with equal importance to the story, despite Terra being the first character you play as, the story revolving around her for the majority of the game, the narrative largely following her perspective, her theme also doubling as the world map theme, and main theme of the game, and her acting as the representative of Final Fantasy VI in all of the spin-off and crossover titles. Yeah, she's totally not the main character. Yes, Final Fantasy VI does have an ensemble cast, but Terra is clearly the main character, and the one party member that most of the plot revolves around for the majority of the story. Sure, Jon Snow isn't technically the main character of Game of Thrones, but Jon Snow is the main character of Game of Thrones. The main difference between Jon Snow and Terra is that, relative to the length of their stories, Terra gets far more screen time than Jon. She's the main character. Well, at least for the first half of the story. For the second half of the game, one could easily argue that Celeste steals main character status. But, for the purposes of this ranking, ranking individual main characters from all of the mainline games and tactics, we are going to be looking at Terra. While I think that Terra has an interesting bat story and fantastic character design, I find her lacking in a distinct personality. I don't think her character has much agency, with or without a slave crown, and I don't think her character arc is particularly compelling. It doesn't resonate with me at all, and the fact that most of her story falls off in the latter half of the game is a weakness for me. Yes, her story does resolve in the world of ruin, but for me, it never quite struck an emotional chord. 
Tara is half human, half Esper, and her arc revolves around learning how to have real human emotions and feel love for other people. She has to learn how to interact with others and learn how to care for others. Honestly, this feels incredibly alien to me. I never had issues being able to relate to and connect with other people. Socially awkward JRPG kids will vibe with the, but how do I people, arc. But I find Tara's over-the-top inability to connect with other people to feel empty, because it doesn't feel real. Her core arc isn't a strong enough character anchor to center the story around, and I think the ensemble nature of Six's cast helps hide how weak her story ultimately is. She would be fine as a supporting character, but I think she does not work well as a narrative centerpiece. Terra shares a lot in common with Celis. Both of them are magic-infused former soldiers of the Empire who defect and have to learn how to love after their hardships. Celis learns to find romantic love and forgiveness for herself, while Terra is just trying to learn basic human emotions. I think Celis has a more interesting personality and arc than Terra, but the two characters are similar enough where I think that combining them would have made for a much stronger lead. Combine their backstories and abilities, and as far as personality goes, lean towards the writing down with Celis, but you can include the arc of learning the value of maternal love. If that was the lead character of Six, we'd be looking at a top 5 Final Fantasy main character. But that's not what we got. We got Terra. She's not a terrible character, and I do see the appeal, but she doesn't quite work for me, and that's why Six's main character ranks at the number 10 spot on this list. If you're still not happy about this ranking and want to argue that Six doesn't have the main character, then fine. I won't argue. Six has no main character, which means we can go ahead and bump Six down to last place on this list. Wanna do that? No? Didn't think so. Okay, moving on. Number 9, Final Fantasy XII. In terms of plot significance, Ash should be the main character of Final Fantasy XII. When the game was originally being developed, the main character was supposed to be Bosch. But the higher-ups at Square Enix wanted a younger, teenage protagonist, and we got Vaughn instead, a character who has next to nothing to do with the main plot, has little reason to go on the adventure, and is basically just a wide-eyed kid along for the ride. In terms of narrative significance and the overall plot, Vaughn is a pretty weak character. He doesn't really need to be there, and if he was gone, the story actually wouldn't be all that different in the long run. However, the character is actually pretty well written. Vaughn has a distinct personality, dreams, goals and ambitions, clear relationships with other characters, and his views on the world are pretty well defined. But he's also shown to be willing to evolve his opinions as new information arises. He's generally likable. He has his share of flaws and can be a bit stubborn in some areas, but he shows maturity and grace in his ability to learn and grow. Honestly, his biggest weakness as a character is only his lack of connection to the main plot, but as an individual character, he's quite good and it wouldn't be unreasonable to write a story around a character like him. However, 12 Story was not written around Vaughn, and he was not integrated into the story in the best way. After his arc with Bots resolves early in the game, he loses all sense of agency and is just along for the ride, offering a good POV character for exposition, but not much else for the main plot. Terra fits into Six's story far better than Vaughn fits into Twelve's, but I think Vaughn is actually a more three-dimensional character. He's more fleshed out, has a more defined personality, and though his arc resolves much sooner than Terra's, I think his story is actually stronger overall. Vaughn is a very underrated character in the Final Fantasy series and takes the number 9 spot on this list. Number 8, Final Fantasy VIII. Squall is a very divisive character in the Final Fantasy fandom. While Cloud often gets incorrectly stereotyped as a brooding emo boy, and is often greatly criticized for that, Cloud is not that character at all. However, Squall is that brooding emo boy. He's antisocial, aloof, rude, and has fairly low self-confidence. But on the other side of the coin, he's also hyper-competent, a badass on the battlefield, and because of his high degree of competence, He's quick to get annoyed with others who can't keep up with him. While he is good at his job, it still doesn't make sense why everyone around Squall likes him and pushes him into leadership positions because he doesn't do anything to justify that adoration. Yeah, dude is really good at fighting, but that doesn't mean he's good at delivering orders and motivating a team. But I find that to be more of an issue with Final Fantasy VIII's plot rather than Squall as a character. Squall is a character coping with the trauma of being abandoned as a child and losing his closest personal connection. It's something that he carried with him his entire life, and because of this trauma, he began to push others away as a safety mechanism to ensure nobody gets close enough to him again where he would feel the hurt of their loss. Yes, Squall's trauma isn't as dramatic as a child experiencing the horrors of war, but his abandonment issues are still incredibly realistic. I think Terra is the loner character JRPG fans want to see themselves as, but Squall is a more realistic representation. He lashes out, he can be cruel, he can be short-sighted, and he can miss the bigger picture as he gets too caught up in his own thoughts. But he's still a good person at heart who cares for other people, but he's afraid to open up and get hurt again. His social isolation isn't alien like Terra's, 
What is this thing you humans call love? No, he's just antisocial because he's a teenager who's moody about some hurt in his past and doesn't know how to talk to people. It's real, and it's probably so real that it's uncomfortable for a lot of fans. I get not liking Squall. I totally get that. I wouldn't want to hang out with the guy either. But do I think he's a well-written character? Absolutely. Imagine you're dealing with the motley crew he has to lead, trying to get Zell and Selfie to do their damn jobs. You'd be frustrated all the time too. Imagine being thrust into leadership roles for no coherent reason. You'd also be questioning what the hell Sid is thinking. Squall deals with a lot of BS, and him thinking about how absurd the situations he finds himself in is completely reasonable. Is his response to his frustrations reasonable? I would argue no. He's overly curt and cruel, and there is no justification for him swiping at Renoa, though I consider that more of a fault of Katase's directing more than anything else, as the rest of the staff vehemently disagreed with the inclusion of that in the game. I don't want to downplay that, though, as we've seen those with antisocial tendencies lash out in violent rage. It's a discussion worth having, and there are so many layers to the onion that is Squall. As a character, he's definitely less likable than Terra and Vaughn, but he is most definitely a realistic, moody, annoying teenager, which is a mirror that a lot of JRPG fans don't want to look at, either because they are that person and don't want to acknowledge this, or because they aren't that person, know that person in real life, and really don't like that person because they're a little asshole. But again, that's a well-written character, whether or not they're likable. Squall is the emo kid who thinks that nobody can understand him, but he falls in love, breaks down his shell, and opens up. It's a very human arc and very realistic, especially during teenage years. Squall feels like a real person. He's an asshole, sure, but he's a real asshole. He has significant flaws, but like many of us who were arguably bad people as teenagers, we get to see him mature into a kind adult and become a better person. He's well written and worthy of the number 8 spot on this list. Before we move on to number 7, I have a couple of quick points I wanted to mention. Squall has a very cool character design. He looks awesome. I'm a rocker, and I love his rock and roll, black and leather look. I vibe with that. Hard. Also, Laguna is a much more likable character than Squall. I know Laguna isn't the main character in 8, but I felt it was worth mentioning how rad he is because he's the best character in the game, and if he were the main character in the game, it's likely 8 would rank much higher. Number 7, Final Fantasy XIII. A lot of folks argue that XIII is like Final Fantasy VI, and that the game doesn't have a main character either, and is rather an ensemble cast, with no clear lead. It's a bad argument in regards to Final Fantasy VI, and it's also a bad argument in relation to Final Fantasy XIII. While both games do a good job of giving other characters a chance to shine, when it comes to top billing, it's clear that Terra is the lead in VI, and clear that Lightning is the lead in XIII. Also, does anybody else think it's a bit odd that the two main series games that clearly have female leads are the two games that people argue it's an ensemble cast and there's no main character? Look, it would be bad faith and incredibly reductive to say that you're sexist if you don't think that Terra is the main character of Final Fantasy VI and Lightning is the main character of Final Fantasy XIII. But... Lightning is similar to Squall in a lot of ways with her cold exterior, but she's more harsh and actively aggressive than he is. Squall tends to be more passive-aggressive, while Lightning is more aggressive-aggressive. Like Squall, her cold demeanor stems from her reaction to early childhood trauma. The death of both of Lightning's parents at a young age forced adult responsibilities upon Lightning, including acting as guardian and caregiver for her younger sister, Sarah. For Lightning, growing up meant becoming tough and cold, as that was her way of showing strength. Joining the military further ingrained this mentality into Lightning, turning her into a hardened, no-nonsense soldier. This combination of factors leads to Lightning having a very believable and realistic personality. Those of us who have gone through early childhood trauma that forces us to mature faster can relate to Lightning's thrusted personality, and any of us with military family know how much the battlefield can harden a soul. Lightning is someone who wants order above all else. Her life was chaotic, and she desired structure so much that she willed it upon herself and was successful for a while. Her reactions to other characters are all informed by who she is as a character, rather than merely a necessity of the plot. She doesn't like Snow because she views him as a reckless, unorganized idiot, a far cry from the life of stability and order she wants for her younger sister. She has sympathy for Hope because she sees a part of herself in him, and when she realizes that she may be a corrupting influence upon the youth, she does her best to try to rectify this so that he can head down a better path. This realization of who she has become and how it can negatively impact others is a level of growth and self-understanding not seen by the majority of Final Fantasy characters. Lightning grows and evolves over the course of the story, learning to soften her heart and open herself up to others, but also learning to become a truly strong leader to guide her companions through the darkest time of their lives. In many ways, she is similar to Squall, but ultimately better written in my estimation. 
And Light Squall, she has an awesome design and looks super cool. Lightning is a great Final Fantasy character and one of the absolute best protagonists in the entire series. Number 6, Final Fantasy XV. Final Fantasy XV is a flawed, mixed bag of a game, especially in regards to story and characterization. The years that the game spent in development hell led to a plethora of changes that drastically altered core aspects of the narrative. The Noctis that was created by Tetsuya Nomura for Versus 13 was likely a very different character than what ended up in 15. I suspect that the Noctis Nomura created was more of an anti-hero with darker tendencies and might have ended his narrative arc as a villain. The Noctis of Versus 13 also had a constant motif around sleeping and dreaming, which has mostly been lost in the final game, but had lingered as far into development as the Duskai demo. A lot of elements that Nomura, the original creator of Noctis, considered core to the character were stripped away and drastically altered, ultimately creating a character who was similar in name and appearance, but likely a different person in terms of personality altogether. With all of that said, it's really impressive that the Noctis we got in Final Fantasy XV is not only a great character, but one of the best characters in Final Fantasy history. Noctis is the young, spoiled Prince of Insomnia sent off on a last hurrah road trip before entering into an arranged political marriage with his childhood friend, the Oracle Luna Freya. Noctis has a tense and distant relationship with his father and doesn't want to deal with the burdens of royalty, and ultimately his arc is one of growing up and accepting responsibility. The story of Final Fantasy XV is a coming of age story, and like many a great coming of age story, Noctis is supported by his close friends as they grow and learn together. Final Fantasy Versus 13 may have been a story of vengeance and romance, but Final Fantasy XV is a story of brotherhood, of how you can rely on your best friends through the hardest of times, and how your close friends are ultimately the most important people in your life. Noctis has distinct relationships with Gladiolus, Ignis, and Prompto, and you can feel the genuine love and affection he has for his friends, but can also feel the way they can get on each other's nerves, as real friends do. And though Luna doesn't get nearly enough screen time, you can feel the sincerity in Noctis' feelings for her. In many ways, Noctis succeeds as a character because his relationships with those closest to him feels so real. His response to everything that occurs to him over the course of the journey feels real. He begins his journey aloof and uncaring, and then a tragedy strikes that makes him impassioned and angry. Another tragedy strikes, and he becomes moody and disengaged. Eventually, Noctis grows into a mature man, a true leader ready to do what he must, and he lives up to the words of advice his father gave him on their last meeting. Noctis' father, King Regis, told his son to walk tall, and over the course of his journey, Noctis learned how to do so, but he wasn't able to do so alone. He needed his friends to lean on, and thanks to them, he was able to become the hero he needed to be. He stopped being the selfish boy and became a man willing to sacrifice his very existence for the sake of the world. Noctis is a true hero and one of the best main characters in the Final Fantasy series. Number 5, Final Fantasy Tactics. Ramza is one of the purest and most heroic characters in the series, which makes him stand tall in stark contrast to the morally gray characters in the world of Final Fantasy Tactics. A man for all seasons, Ramza's moral compass is distinct, among the nobility. While others would be willing to use the lower class as nothing more than pawns, Ramza sees the humanity in all people and is one of the few nobles to treat the proletariat with dignity and respect. Whereas his peers may question the right way for them to obtain more power, Ramza instead questions the right way to use the power he has. Ramza always tries to do the right and morally just thing, and isn't willing to compromise said morals for the sake of political machinations and scheming. While others may take an ends justify the means approach, Ramza refuses to engage in acts he deems evil for the sake of a greater good, and would rather tarnish his own name and reputation than hurt others. His selfless actions allows him to save the world, but he dies in obscurity and remains nothing more than a footnote in history. He doesn't seek fame or glory, he just seeks to help others the best he can. He has no grand schemes for power, but rather he's the type to sacrifice himself and lose power if he believes it the right thing to do. But he's no simple-minded idiot. Ramza is clever, a brilliant fighter and a brilliant tactician, and he needs to be in order to compete with some of the most dastardly minds in Ivalice. But he's up to the challenge. He's the Captain America of Final Fantasy protagonists, unwavering his commitment to justice and refusal to give up hope on his friends, even if they declare him an enemy. He's a great hero and the one that Ivalice needed in its darkest hour. Ramda is truly a great hero for a great game, and worthy of a top 5 entry on this list. Number 4, Final Fantasy X In terms of the grander narrative of Final Fantasy X, the plot revolves around Yuna, but it's told from Titus's POV, so we will consider him the main character. This might be a controversial take for some, but generally in a JRPG, the character you start with, who gets the most screen time, who you run around as on the map, 
who acts as the narrator and POV character, who is front and center on the box art, is generally considered the main character, so I'm going to consider Titus to be the main character. It really shouldn't be controversial, but I've seen the comment sections on videos, and sadly this is considered a mildly spicy take nowadays. Anyway, Titus is the main character of Final Fantasy X, and he's a great lead. While Final Fantasy XV tried to capture a complicated father-son relationship, it didn't quite succeed. Final Fantasy X, however, knocked this element out of the park and perfectly showed why Titus has an adversarial relationship with his father. Titus' father, Jet, was an alcoholic and was constantly verbally abusive to his son. To the outside world, Jet was a star blitzball player, a beloved athlete adored across the world, and this only fueled Titus' hatred of him. The outside world saw a great man, but Titus saw a cruel monster. When Titus comes to an entirely new world and finds out his father is also beloved and respected there, it continues to infuriate him, as he can't escape the shadow of his father. Titus, over the course of his journey, is forced to learn that there's more to his father than simply his perspective on him, and that Jet is ultimately a complex man full of good and bad. Titus learns to reconcile his feelings and ultimately confront his father, and honestly, it's really, really great. The writing of their relationship is superb. But moving aside from just Titus's relationship with his father, Titus also works incredibly well as a piece of Ten's greater narrative. For starters, him being a star athlete from another world works incredibly well for a number of reasons. Because he's a star athlete, his general physical prowess makes sense within the context of the story, and thus his ability to keep up with the trained fighters in Yuna's entourage makes sense because he already is in peak physical condition. And while this has been noted in many reviews of Final Fantasy X, it's worth mentioning again. Titus being an outsider offers a great in-story reason for characters to offer expository dialogue explaining Spira's culture, offering a way for the player to learn this information alongside the character without it feeling forced in the slightest. Titus's outsider status is ultimately what allows Sin to be defeated in the end. Outsiders are able to look at systems with more objectivity and call out flaws in said systems, and because Titus was willing to criticize Yevon and Spira's cycle of death for what it was, he was able to change those around him, and in doing so, he was able to help Yuna and her companions shift their perspective enough where they could find a different solution to the problem of sin, and finally end the cycle of death. Titus and Yuna also have, in my opinion, the best romance in the series. Their love story seems gradual and genuine. It's believable to see the two of them falling for each other, based on initial physical attraction and intrigue, and then the two of them getting to know each other over the course of the journey. Their conversations feel real, and by the end of the game, so does their love. If Titus wasn't a completely believable character, their romance would fall flat, but he's well realized enough where you completely buy into their love. Visually, Titus's asymmetric design is very Nomura, and very appealing. His color scheme evokes feelings of water, which ties in perfectly with his Blitzball star persona. He's the kind of character you would only see in a Final Fantasy game, and his look is iconic. There's the plot twist around him being a dream, which is controversial among some fans, but I thought the twist was clever, and that the abstract idea added uniqueness to him as a character. And for those who say the dream thing doesn't make sense, just replace the word dream with summon. Titus is basically a summon, but he's summoned by the collective unconscious of Spira's summons. He's a summon summoned by summons. If you're the kind of person who likes Xenogears but says Titus being a dream doesn't make sense, I'm pretty sure you're just a liar and you just don't like Titus. And I get it. Titus can be annoying at times, but that's the point. He's not perfect. He needs an ego check. He needs to learn humility. He needs to learn how to be open-minded. He needs to learn how to confront his past in a healthy way so he can let go. In the end, he learns all of those things and grows into a great hero. Overall, Titus is an excellent Final Fantasy protagonist, and for my money, one of the absolute best in the series. Number 3, Final Fantasy IX. Zidane was a breath of fresh air the series desperately needed at the time of his debut. After three games in a row of moodier, angstier protagonists, it was refreshing to see somebody who was unapologetically fun. He didn't have a chip on his shoulder or antisocial tendencies. No, he was the opposite. He was the life of the party. Zidane is funny, charming, competent, and upon first glance, didn't seem like he was carrying around a ton of emotional baggage. We would later find out that this isn't true, and he would need to confront his past in demons like we all do, but he doesn't let his past consume his life like a lot of other characters do. Instead of being a sulking loner, Zidane is a fun-loving flirt who has an excitement for adventure and travel, a guy who is incredibly easy to get along with. He's the kind of person where you can see why people would gravitate towards him. He seems like a cool, chill dude that you could have a fun time with, but he's also got a kind heart and is the kind of bloke who would buy you dinner if you were short on cash. People want to be his friend, and it's clear to see why. He's a real solid dude. It's easy to see why his friends would rally around him in his time of need. 
He's always there for his friends when they need him, and he can soften even the hardest of hearts. Zidane is the perfect embodiment of a power of friendship kind of character when it comes to Final Fantasy leads. He truly excels at this more than any other Final Fantasy protagonist because you can really believe that his friends would ride or die for him. Zidane's personality is incredibly strong, and it's great to see how his personality bounces off other characters and the kind of dynamics they end up forming. He grates on Steiner, acts as a big brother to Vivi, has a genuine romantic fling with Garnet, a playful flirtation with Freya, an aloof friendship with Kina, a rivalry with Amarant, a you're cute kid, but I'm a grown up so maybe find someone your own age to have a crush on relationship with Aiko, and when it comes to Kuja, the combination of hatred, pity, and understanding makes for one of the greatest hero villain dynamics in the series. Zidane has a nuanced relationship with all of these characters, but it's all defined by the kind of person he is and how different kinds of people respond to said personality. He's a fantastic, fully realized character and is easily one of the best in the series. Honestly, my only complaint with Zidane is that I'm not big on his design, but that's a nitpick. He's an incredibly well-written and fantastic lead character. Number 2, Final Fantasy IV One could argue Cecil is the first truly great RPG protagonist. The complexity of his characterization was something unseen in RPGs at the time, and, purely from a historical perspective, he is a monumental influence on the genre. What's more impressive about Cecil, though, is that after all these years, he still holds up as one of the greatest RPG heroes of all time. With as many advances as the genre and series have taken, the fact that Cecil holds up as well as he does is a testament to the brilliant writing of his character. His arc of redemption is a relatable one for the self-reflective among us. The desire to wash away the sins of the past and to become pure, good, and honorable is a very noble quest and feels like an incredibly knightly thing to do. For those of us raised under Judeo-Christian value systems, the central thematic core of Cecil's arc hits very hard. We've all made mistakes in our past, things we wish we could undo, and Cecil goes on that quest to redeem himself for his past crimes. We first see Cecil as a Dark Knight, a traditionally villainous role, stealing a crystal from the innocent mages of Mysidia. Though he was obeying the orders of a king he truly trusts with all his heart, his conscience can't shake the idea that what he was doing was wrong. When he delivers a package to the Village of Mist that sets fire to the village, Cecil becomes an unwitting accomplice in the genocide of the Summoners. It's a bridge too far for the already distraught Cecil. He vows to protect the lone remaining Summoner, Rydia, with his life, even if it means defying his kingdom and betraying his country. He knows there is no honor in these atrocious war crimes. No, the honorable path is the hard path, to find his kingdom, and he begins on a path of redemption. On his path, he sheds his dark armor and becomes a paladin, a holy knight, born anew. His power is even initially reduced when he first becomes a paladin, but he is willing to lose his dark knight powers if the power of light can eventually lead to justice. But even after becoming a paladin, his sins aren't washed away. He needs to earn the trust of those in Mysidia and other places his kingdom has hurt, through his actions. Thus, Cecil continues to do just acts to earn his redemption. He takes the righteous and honorable path, even when it's hard, and earns his forgiveness. Through his journey throughout the game, Cecil becomes a true hero, and those who once may have viewed Cecil as their worst enemy come to view him as a staunch ally. He is ultimately forgiven through his selfless and heroic acts, and it all stems from his desire to do the right thing. He's a fantastic character purely on an internal level, but he also has interesting dynamics and relationships with other characters that adds extra layers to his depth. For instance, Cecil and Rosa are already in a relationship before the start of the game, so rather than seeing him court Rosa as would have been the norm in other JRPGs, we get to see the two of them have a mutually supportive relationship, having deep conversations about their thoughts and feelings, and lifting one another up. It's nice to see two adults just have a genuinely healthy relationship in a video game. There's also his rivalry with Kane, who he views like a brother, and though their battles may be fierce, he never loses affection for his brother from another mother. And speaking of brothers, Cecil learns to extend forgiveness to his actual brother, Golbez. Knowing how difficult it was for Cecil to forgive himself, he extends kindness as his brother goes on a journey of self-discovery similar to his own, and in that act it shows how much Cecil has grown over the course of the game. He knows how hard it is to forgive oneself and to forgive others, but he has learned how to forgive with dignity and grace. And all of this is from a Super Nintendo game. I'm able to see why someone might prefer Final Fantasy VI to Final Fantasy IV, and why a person might think Final Fantasy VI is a better game, but for my money, Cecil is a much stronger character than anybody in Final Fantasy VI, and it's not even close. Cecil is not only one of the best lead characters in the Final Fantasy franchise, he's one of the best lead characters in all of fiction, period. Number 1, Final Fantasy VII 
Cloud is easily the most popular Final Fantasy protagonist, and when you're that popular, you have a larger target on your back. Cloud is often written off as being a generic emo boy, and I understand why, because that's how the compilation in Kingdom Hearts portrayed him. However, that is not the Cloud of the original Final Fantasy VII, and Remake, to its credit, got his characterization right, and the negative stereotypes about his characterization are finally starting to fade from the discourse. Cloud is not a selfing emo boy. He's a cold-hearted mercenary who only cares about getting paid, but he has a soft spot for his childhood friend and a flower girl that begins to open his heart. While he's initially driven by wanting to find and stop Sephiroth, Cloud eventually becomes attached to his party of friends and comes to genuinely care for the well-being of the planet. On first glance, Cloud seems tough, confident, and cool, an expert who knows everything and can handle anything. However, we notice early on there's signs of Cloud being an unreliable narrator, and through the course of the game, we learn this persona is nothing more than a facade. After his close friend Zack died protecting him, Cloud took on elements of Zack's identity and traits and incorporated them into his own personality and internal history as a way of handling the numerous traumas he had experienced. Cloud didn't want to confront his past because of shame for his failures and his shattered psyche created a new one he could accept better than reality. But when Cloud finally did decide to confront his past and find his true self, he found reasons to be proud of himself, to love himself, and to accept himself for the person he truly is. Not all of Cloud's personality was an act, but some of his memories were a messy amalgamation of his story and Zack's, and only by accepting himself is Cloud able to break past that drama and emerge as a fuller person. He does all of this with the help of friends who love him, and in turn Cloud steps up and does what he needs to do in order to save the world. Cloud isn't just an emo boy. He's a well-rounded character full of charm. He tells dad jokes, he fights passionately for his friends, he's full of heart. You can feel his relationships develop with the cast of the game, and they all feel genuine, in part due to how well-written Cloud is. Each interaction feels authentic. This authenticity leads to some amazing storytelling moments. The best example of this is Cloud's response to the death of Aerith. The speech he delivers here is one of the most powerful emotional moments in the entire franchise. It's so visceral and real. You can feel the flurry of emotions from him. The anger, the sadness, the denial. It's messy because emotions are messy. Grief is messy and Cloud's messy response feels so real. Cloud is an icon. It's not just because of his cool design and how satisfying he is from a gameplay perspective. He's an icon because he's an incredibly well-written character and his story is incredible. Cloud is a character who learned to confront his demons and step up as a true hero. He's a rich, layered, complex character and he's the best main character in a Final Fantasy game. Thanks for watching this video. Again, these lists are my personal opinion, and I'm definitely curious to see you guys posting your rankings in the comments below. Be sure to do the YouTube things, the liking, the subscribing, etc. And if you like this video, don't forget to check out the other rankings in the series. Thanks for watching, and I hope you find peace and happiness in your life. Cheers!